Okay, hi everyone. So, welcome to Pavilion 4. Um, this talk was originally titled Tinkering with a... Yeah, okay, this new thing, Swift. Um, also known as Bad Code Written, written Quickly. Um, so, first off, a warning, this talk contains bugs. Um, feel free to yell out and complain about them. Um, I know they're there, there were some issues, so play a game, see how many you can spot. Um, this talk is going to be shorter than I originally intentioned, um, so feel free to ask questions. I will try and answer them as best I can or direct you to better sources. Um, and for some reason, my presenter notes have not appeared. Yay, I'll fix that in a moment. Um, why have... Thank you, thingy. All right, so this might not be the talk you're looking for. Um, given the number of Intro to Swift um, talks and indeed the workshop that was given, the decision was made to try and just tinker this a little bit to not just be so much about here's how you use every single function of Swift. It's more of a here are some good, here are some bad, be aware of these issues that may crop up, and then how does this sit in a context of real work out there? Um, so, first of all, I'm not primarily a Swift programmer. In fact, I'm not even primarily an Apple dev programmer. Um, as was kind of mentioned in my bio, I am, I pick up Xcode and I pick up Objective-C when I need to fix specific things in the Apple domain. Um, so, I may have a different opinion to what a lot of you have, and that's cool. Um, it would be interesting just to see how that actually comes out. Um, so, this talk is, yeah, about, about Apple and how it result, and how, how it can kind of play a role in larger business and enterprise. Anyway, let's actually carry on with some real talk. Um, so I'm Matthew, I'm nominally a student. Um, I'm also a volunteer, but I work part-time at a project management firm. That's um, where I get a lot of my work experience from. Um, so I deal with large projects. They range from inventory management systems to um, actually going out into the field and dealing with um, railway sleepers that are being deployed to all sorts of things. Um, and then from time to time I actually end up being a labourer just because to really understand what's going on in your, in your project it's good to have actually, it's good to have field experience. Um, and then I come back in and I code and I end up being a server admin, so that's me. Um, so I claim I can code. Um, on the inventory management stuff, I did a lot of things in SQL. Um, I wrote a project management system in VBA, yeah. Um, I'm sure, like many of you, um, I've, I've written just the most awful WordPress PHP hacks. I, I hate PHP, sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, I get dragged in to do lots of random projects. Um, so how did I get involved with Apple development? So. In Tasmania, there's this wonderful company called Tasrail. Um, so for a bit of background, you kind of need it to understand what happened. In, it was all state-owned infrastructure. And then in 1997, it was sold off to a multinational. Um, and they actually went through a couple of multinationals. And part of the deal was the multinationals would maintain the rail infrastructure in Tasmania. That didn't really happen. <laughs> Not surprising, but it, it just... No. Um, so by 2009, the government had reacquired all of the rail and had to do extensive maintenance on the line. There were major tracks between Hobart and Launceston, the two main um, cities in Tasmania. Uh, a lot of freight goes between them. There were parts of the track that were down to, I think, six kilometres an hour speed restrictions because the track had degraded so badly. Um, so I was uh, part of the, my project management firm was actually in there. Um, Tazrail hadn't done any major capital work at this stage for over 20 years. So we were there helping them establish a new project management office. Um, so I was nominally writing software for the PMO, um, doing things like um, asset tracking, financials, um, checking where 
uh, status of project and deployments, all those sorts of things were. Um, but as part of that, I was involved with other people working on different projects, one of them being that Tazrail didn't really have any understanding of what needed to be done on their own network. Um, because they had just come in and taken everything over again, most of the problems in the network weren't known, so they didn't know at which point on the track there were problems with sleepers, where there were signal outages, anything like that. The entire network had to be remapped to actually find the problems. So it needed to be done, but like all things, you kind of run into this sort of problem. Money's no object, unless of course you plan to spend it. So had to do this cheaply. Um, so doing it cheaply, boots on the deck. Use people who you already have purchase orders for. Um, if you already have a purchase order through a company, they just say, hey, you're already approved, you can go work. Um, originally, it was talked about getting specialized systems to do all this, but that means getting it through management, getting approvals. So not only are, is there additional funds that need to be approved, you've got problems with lead times because this needed to be done because you've got workers waiting to actually go do work. So I'm going to drive all the lines. Well, why don't we don't just, as we drive, take GPS coordinates of everything? That, that seems like a nice, simple approach. Cool. Um, we're just going to sit in the car and write them out, or, well, that's probably not going to be feasible because we're going to need to be taking points every few minutes and jostling around and stuff. So need something that's electronic. And also dealing with that many data points is just not feasible if it's all on pen and paper. Um, so it was a bit of a case of which programmers are available and what's actually being deployed in the field. Well, the person in the car is an Apple user. So it was probably going to be an Apple application. And all the Windows developers were busy. I was free. So it ended up being, hey, Matt, you kind of know Objective-C. Yeah, kind of. Can you write this thing? Uh, sure. So I ended up being roped into writing an OS X app. Um, it wasn't an iPad app, because at the time, the iPads weren't certified for the line. Um, it's actually inter interesting how many things that normally quite fine in terms of electronic noise. You take them into rail, and suddenly, no, they're not. iPads, I think, are actually fine now, but they just hadn't been certified, so couldn't use them. Anyway, um, I actually have this as a video, but if people would like to see a live demo, I wasn't sure if I could actually do a live demo because I didn't know how much glass there'd be in the room. But what would people prefer, the video or demo? Yeah. A Sorry? A I have a coin. <laughs> video it is. Hey, play. Okay. So what we basically had here was a Bluetooth profile, um, the um, serial profile, um, going between the laptop and GPS unit. Um, you, you can start reading at any point, so you'll end up with some malformed characters at the start. The OS fortunately handles that for you. Pardon me. Um, but it means that you, you'll, have, you'll have to deal with malformed characters, but you don't have to deal with malformed um, bit strings. So that's nice. Once all that happens, you get Namir strings. Um, and then all of that just gets logged out to text. Um, when buttons are pressed, that basically gets stuck in core data with notes about the valid point. Um, there are two sets of coordinates, valid and current, because as you go through tunnels and things, the, um, the actual GPS signal just completely drops off. And you need to know that it's completely dropped off. So the coordinate may just be crap. Anyway, so this saves out. And you export that to CSV, and you're good to go. So hey, it's not pretty, but at least it works. Um, and that was done in a few days um, with me not having any application experience with Objective-C prior to that, just some textbook knowledge, basically. Um, so what I got out of that was that um, Coca is really cool. Um, it's nice, it's quick. My suction cup didn't work properly. Um, <laughs> and Xcode's lovely. Um, interface Builder is great. Um, so I really enjoyed my like, weekish stint as an Apple developer. Um, 
Objective-C has some weird syntaxes, but what language doesn't? Um, then you kind of look at blocks and go, why was it done that way? Just Anyway, um, oh, I got to learn about retain and release because the deployment target was 10.5, so no arc. But that said, retain and release, that's pretty damn awesome as far as memory management goes. It's a lot better than alloc and malloc. Um, arc was cool. I did actually start playing with it, but realized it was a 10.5 target. Um, and the Apple example code and documentation was awesome. I would actually like to point out, um, I'll just go back a sec. Note the, oh, you can't see it in the video very well. Bum, never mind. Um, so the actual um, application title for that was the original Apple example code, which was originally that long and then ended up, ended up being about 1,200 lines because if you're going to do something badly, you might as well do it all in one class. <laughs> um, so yeah, that worked. Um, and then, you know, I haven't done anything with Apple in a while and I'm going to be asked to again in the near future and it's going to be this wonderful new thing. Yay! So, because I'm going to be asked to do something with it shortly, um, I thought it'd actually be good to come and give a talk about my experiences trying to learn how to use this new language and kind of contrast it back to how I found coming in the first time. And that was my initial plan for the talk. Um, so I started looking at my old code and kind of got a bit despondent, um, as you do. I think there were some pretty bad um, comments in there that still had fix me on them. One of them was a synchronization error where it wouldn't ever really be called the way the application was being used, but if it did, everything would explode. Anyway, so time for a new thing. That means Xcode. You need a new one. So go download latest stable build of six. Um, so just like before, go log into my Apple developer account, download the thing, all good. But this being Australia and particularly Tasmania in my little corner, where there's no NBN, it's going to take all day. So let's get that going, move on, and start looking at just Apple documentation, because, hey, that's at least useful use of my time. So let's do a search. So on the front page, use the search, type in Swift, and set the checkbox for um, guides, I think. Oh, sorry, example code. There was only one entry, which kind of surprised me, given how much example code there was when I had done this thing in the past. All right, okay, new thing. There's probably not that, they haven't done any real examples yet. That's cool. Um, what is there as far as guides are concerned? Again, that kind of surprised me. There's not really anything there, according to the search. Okay. Uh, what's there for everything else? Right, plenty of things. Okay, that's, that's a bit better. We can actually look at some stuff now. And so, okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I want to just play with the Bluetooth stack again. So type in Bluetooth for the search, no results. Not quite what I was expecting. Um, so, oh well. So, developer.apple.com forward slash Swift forward slash references. There's a link to this basically on the front page of developer. Okay, what resources are there? Well, there's this really great document called the Swift Program Lang uh, Programming Language Guide. It's actually, I was surprised at just how thorough it was. If you need to, uh, actually, how many, of you, how many of you have actually played with Swift yet? Or how many of you are doing it seriously at the moment? Or, okay, so two serious, but the rest of you are three? But the rest of you haven't really played with Swift much yet. Okay. For those of you that aren't doing much in Swift yet but want to, this guide is awesome. Really good. Um, it's almost complete. Very few errors from what I've found so far. Um, the examples are, for the most part, good, though sometimes you'll find external clarification is useful, um, as I will show you shortly. Um, the biggest problem I had with it was that if you search for it on Google, you will randomly end up in different versions of the document, especially old ones where the coding examples are completely wrong. Um, and the other thing that kind of wigged me out was that why wasn't this showing up under guides in the search? It was actually showing up as a resource. So, 
Eh, it's nitpicking, but it just kind of wigs you out if you're coming in cold. So, Xcode finally downloaded. Awesome, let's start playing with some stuff. I go to make a project because that's what I'm familiar with. And I click on the drop down box language and it says um, Objective C only. And I'm like, ah. So go and make an iOS one. Oh, that can be Swift. Go and read through release notes. Oh, they pulled Swift from 6.0 release for OS 10. OK. Sure, I could play with iOS at the same time I'm learning Swift, but given that what I did was OS 10, I kind of want to leave it simple and just do OS 10. So let's go grab the beta. Um, but in the meantime, I can at least play with Playgrounds, because Playgrounds is meant to be cool. You can at least experiment with the language. Um, sure. So I got this far. I commented, when, when you start, you get the first line comment, import some Cocoa, a, uh, a variable declaration, instantiation. Commented that out, I want to do my own. Var, sp um, space, then this happened. Right. That's not gone well. Um, OK, hit OK, tried it again, and it's not gone well. All right, let's close Xcode, reopen Xcode, out, it starts working. OK, it's working, but not the greatest instilling of confidence in this experience. Oh, well, so let's get the beta. I hear it's more stable. That comes down. So let's actually talk about Swift, because everything is awesome. What parts of Swift would I really try and emphasize if I was trying to sell this to someone? If I was like, Swift is amazing. Do it because, use Swift because of these reasons. Uh, and, hmm? Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. Um, so, the very, so the first reason, I mean, it's not Swift specifically, but as far as being in the Apple environment is, and as I've already said, Xcode is freaking awesome. So it was just a pleasure coming back to Xcode. It has the best code completion of any IDE I've ever used. It's, it's nice. It, it works. It doesn't give me junk. Um, it also has some great error checking. Um, one of the things that really makes me happy is that unlike Visual Studio, when I start it, it doesn't take 7 to 15 minutes to actually get to a point where I can type something. Um, and a few other niceties along those sorts of lines. So Swift itself. This is quite possibly my single favorite feature in the whole language. The fact that unlike every other language I work in, you can nest comments. This saves me so much time, I can't even really begin to, yeah. I mean, it's not really, it's a simple addition to the language and it's kind of like, yeah, okay, but for people who are used to not having that, big deal. Um, optionals. I really like the idea, particularly because I grew up on Star Trek and everything, whenever they would talk about programming in Star Trek, there'd always be this concept of trinary and one of the values was an optional. Zero, one, or undefined. Just cool. All right. So what does that actually let me do? Well, optional for any type, you can be a value of x or you can not have a value, nil. So. When you have an optional, it's basically the same as a regular definition, except you have a, que uh, yeah, you have a question mark on the end. Um, when you check for it, it's just a simple um, equality check with nil. Um, then you just deal with the case as, in, as is. Um, you have optional bindings, which are just a quick shorthand way of um, actually checking and then using the variable. There's other niceties, such as um, um, implicit, uh, implicit optional, um, which allows you to, and I've just lost my train of thought, which allows you to, um, one of the use cases for optionals is that you have variables that don't have a value until they're instantiated and then you can just assume that they're going to have a value from that point on. They're implicit optionals. So the idea is that you, um, it actually, 
It's a shorthand way of dealing with optionals just so that you can get, get in and use them quicker because they're going to have a value as soon as they're set. Great idea. And that slide was meant to disappear. OK. I absolutely love the switching statements which have been brought in. Um, I guess it's because of some of the interfaces I end up working with, which are quite hierarchical. hierarchical. So apply, change at one point, affect everything else. I just use them all the time. It's, I don't know. I seem to just use them abnormally. So new switching statement, really flexible. You have your standard deal of you have a case and that can have a value, but you can have a case and have multiple values assigned to the case. You can have a range of values assigned to a case. Awesome. Um, and of course, you've got your defaults. Um, and it applies just as well to strings as to ints as to your own um, definitions. Um, when I was kind of trouting, uh, trouting, when I was touting this to some of the colleagues I work with, <laughs> I was like, hey, you can do all these things. And one of them just kind of looked at me and said, so we're back to using Pascal. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we're, we're, Pascal did that like 40 years ago. And I'm like, oh. Hey, it's a modern language that does it. Yeah. Um, the one thing that kind of threw me at first with switching statements, though, um, and if you're coming in from another environment, you have to be aware of, every other language, well, not every other, but pretty much every other language, you have explicit breaks after every case um, if you only wanted to execute that one case. Whereas Swift has gone for the notion of the default behavior is a break, so we're just going to implicitly include breaks. Um, that's interesting. The one thing, though, is that when you're reading the documentation, um, the, my initial assumption and a couple of other people who I've spoken to had the same assumption was that there's no control for um, fall through. Um, there is, which is great, but yeah, kind of freaked everyone out at first. Um, so if you want fall through so you can execute everything, so in case one actually have lamp, desk, and chair printed. This is how you deal with it. Um, so I complained about blocks earlier. Closures. They're much nicer as far as the syntax is concerned. Um, effectively, a closure is any bit of code that can be called later, and you just enclose it with um, the curly parentheses. Much nicer syntax, more flexible. Um, in fact, functions are actually just a, a specialized type of, um, of closure. So you use them a lot. The one thing is that as you come in and you're not, ex again, because I'm talking about coming in cold, when you first see some of the coding examples, it's a bit weird. But that's, that's OK. Um, so that was some of my favorite things I've come across in Swift. Um, not so awesome stuff. Um, I've already spoken about playgrounds. Now that's, that's not so much a problem with Swift as it is a, um, an issue with it still being a young language and a young environment, but quite jarring given that playgrounds is, the, is where you're supposed to learn the basics of the language. If your first experience with coding is going to be crash after crash or um, incorrect values or anything like that, it's just going to make it difficult for you to get into it. Um, I really debated whether to include this in the awesome features or not. Swift has amazing um, string comparison, which is great because this is what you want most of the time. It allows you to do really fancy things such as uh, you can define there are multiple characters in Unicode that have equivalency, but they are different characters. Um, Swift cares about them being um, effectively linguistically equal. So you can, when you do a comparison, as long as they, as long as the reader would interpret them the same way, the comparison comes back successful. The problem is that there are times when you do care about things being exactly the same. And there may be a way to actually do that, rather than writing, rolling your own code for it. But I've not seen it. And in searching for it, I couldn't find it. 
Um, it's not obvious. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if that exists, but it really, if it does exist, it needs to be exposed a lot better than it was. The biggest issue is that because it does it like this, you'll probably forget that it does it like this, and that can introduce problems if you're not expecting it. Um, so you, you get this sort of situation. These two E's can, in fact, be completely different Unicode characters, but as far as you and I are concerned, they're the same character. Um, now, going back to what Tim said about safe typing, safe typing is awesome, but I strongly argue, and again, this may be influenced from my background, but I would strongly argue that failure to have explicit typing is going to cause problems, not because the language and the compiler can't handle it, but because it decreases readability from our perspective as programmers. I mean, even if it's not a problem with your own code, looking at other people's code without explicit types in it makes reading it incredibly difficult. So I would recommend um, Swift. For, I really appreciate that Swift has the ability to explicitly define types. I would suggest that you do that just to make it easier for everyone else. Um, and also, going back to my earlier project, coming back to your code 12 months after you wrote it or two years after you wrote it and it's not in your head anymore, you want all of the legibility features you can shove at it. So I'd strongly suggest just defining your types. Um, but that got me thinking about how Swift was structured in general. Um, going through the examples, you could work through it and having the explanation right next to it, you could see what, what the code was doing. But a lot of it I just found hard to read. It wasn't intuitive. Um, I honestly don't know whether that's because I work in so many different environments and I see so many different coding syntaxes or whether it's just unintuitive, it's naturally unintuitive. But it's a concern. So looking at something like this, I have no idea what the 0 and 1 would be normally. Uh, I, you kind of have to sit there and think about it. Yet, so Swift allows for just using numbered parameters, and that's what they are. It's just um, out of the array. But not clean. Um, so yeah, here's an example of a closure. Um, so people like it, but I, I get as programmers we're lazy. I, I really do. I, I am lazy as well. And not having to type out full variables all the time is great. But on the other hand, we're in Xcode. You can type two letters for your variable and then hit tab. So. Yeah, I'd advocate being explicit. Um, so in that kind of frame of mind, I went and did some digging. And I don't know what percentage of the Swift community feels this way, but I do see a vocal group kind of going, yes, Swift has some of these real issues with regards to legibility and um, almost dumbing down the language. It, it, it oversimplifies. Um, so read that blog, that, that entry on that blog. Um, I'll just say it so people can hear it. So um, Owens, uh, O-W-E-N-S-D dot I-O slash 2014-09-24 slash swift dash expectations dot html. That is a really good high-level overview of issues that Swift kind of presents itself with regards to legibility, the ease of use of closures, and a few other things like that. Um, so yeah, Swift, Swift to me really feels like it's trying too hard to make our lives e easier. And for short projects, for learning to code, um, for those sorts of things, I think that's great. But 
once you start getting into complexity, I, I'm kind of concerned long term. And again, biases. So speaking of biases, before I say the next thing, I own Apple products. Um, my business owns Apple products. Um, we have something like 10 or 15 Macs. We have um, eight iPhones that we're about to churn. We, have, we were going to get NextServe, and then Apple killed it, and I'm annoyed at them over it. Um, and I've um, sold gear to other people. That, um, so we use a lot of Apple products um, where we come from. Trying to get Swift adopted as a language and trying to get Xcode adopted um, as an environment has a significant problem in that it requires a Mac. Trying to get things adopt, I mean, I'm not sure how much you guys care about it, but for people who kind of sit in, in between worlds, so I sit between Mac, Windows, and Linux, joy, it's really hard because you're always fighting holy wars. You're fighting the holy war of which OS is best, which OS do we roll out, um, and you get a lot of people kind of jumping on just use Windows because that works in this environment, or just use Mac because that works in this environment. Um, it's really hard when you have a coding environment that only can support one platform. I think most of the cross-platform environments are terrible, but by the same token, a lot of the applications that get built in enterprise are terrible. So long as they work and they don't break the data, that's good enough. So coming from medium and large business, trying to actually use Swift in those contexts is very difficult as a result. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, it's not such a big deal on OS X, and it does very much depend on the managers, and I'll come back to managers in a sec, um, and, and senior um, corporate philosophies. But app signing where you require approval of a third party to deploy your own code onto your own hardware really rubs some environments the wrong way. They just won't accept that. Um, and you could have a change of management three months later, and it's the completely, complete reverse of the philosophy. But it's something you have to bear in mind, particularly in places of rest where restructures are frequent, that people have these biases um, into how their environment should function. And if you're halfway down a project and you get a new senior manager come in and ask why you're doing it this way, you really need to be able to justify it. So this is where probably the meat of my talk is going to be, because this is kind of where my influence has ended up being um, the past few weeks. Um, so in the real world, there are managers. Um, now, I work for a project management firm, um, so I'm, I'm not here trying to claim that all managers are bad, um, far from it. The problem is you get a lot of them that are, um, and that just causes issues. So management loves buzzwords, absolutely loves buzzwords. So Swift is the new buzzword, so that's what I've been dealing with. It's that Management's going, oh, Swift's the new thing, right? Yep, so we need to be using Swift. Well, okay. So, the BS filter. Bad managers don't have one. Um, so, here are some good examples for you. Uh, I've had management randomly buy very expensive CMSs, both in terms of outright cost and deployment costs, because they've been sold on the paperless office and we have never ended up with a paperless office. Um, I've heard uh, financial systems be sold to senior management because, whoa, a thousand transactions a day, you need a $30 million financial system. Um, SharePoint will only run on two gig of RAM. Um, and SAP will fit your organization perfectly. Now, it's not that I mind SAP. SAP is actually great in some contexts, the problem is lots of people see SAP and then shoehorn it into places where it's completely inappropriate. And then you get 60, 50, 100 million dollar boondoggles. Yeah. 
Um, whoops. So really what I'm saying is that people who don't know what they don't know are the most dangerous of all. People who don't understand their own limitations are what get us in trouble. And you have to be able to manage, you have to manage your managers in some cases. So here is a real example. We write software, which is really web apps, in PHP. We need some more firewalls, so we'll build our own in PHP. And I'm not talking about web app firewalls, which are just monitoring the incoming connections to your web app. I'm actually talking about them wanting to do stateful packet inspection, that sort of low-level fun stuff. Mm, yeah. So in this context, what I'm worried about is something like this happening. A manager goes on and on and on about Swift all day because Swift is the new cool thing and they decide we should be writing drivers with it when we're having major compiler and environment issues with it because it's a new language. It's, it's just, it's not ready. And, and it's, it's not even Swift so much in this case. It's that wholesale change in environments is so problematic. I mean, our whole industry is built on change. We can argue whether that's good or bad, it, but it is built on change. But rapid wholesale change, when things are not ready for them, just causes problems. Um, and that's what I'm really worried about Swift. So if you're a Mac shop, I, I I'd stick with Objective-C for the moment. By all means, tinker with Swift. Um, you need to know about it because it's up and coming, but I wouldn't start any major new work on it. Um, so does, it doesn't really cause me to freak out, but Apple is cool, people are stupid, and important people who are stupid are dangerous. So um, Swift is okay. Um, I think it could be better. Um, I, I, I'm kind of disappointed that it's not better. Um, I can see things as far as stability and performance, debugging, um, a whole bunch of the tool chain that just isn't quite right. I can see all of that being fixed even in a matter of months. It could take longer, but it wouldn't surprise me if that part of it is ready for production quite soon. Then the next part becomes getting yourself ready to deal with it in a production environment. Because if you're all Objective-C coders, you know what the pitfalls are. You don't know with Swift yet because you don't have the experience. And yes, it's a chicken and egg problem, but that's why you have your play environments versus your real environments. So if you're new to programming and you're not in the Apple environment, Swift is not enough for me to recommend that you buy a Mac and start playing with Swift. Um, even if those problems with Swift were fixed, I still wouldn't do that. I would probably recommend they just go, go learn on Python. Which is kind of sad because when I looked at Swift and just my initial impression of it was, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's kind of disheartening to have that as your conclusion. Um, so, but if on the other hand, you're, if you're already in the Apple space but you're just not a programmer, part of me says Python, Part of me says Objective-C, and part of me says Swift, particularly once Swift is fixed. There's arguments for and against all of them. In some ways, the worst thing about Swift, I think, is that it does too much for you. But, and when, and when you're learning and you're trying to wrap your head around some of these concepts. But, I don't know. I, I guess that's kind of a disappointing answer, like to hear the person who's gonna be talking about whether you should use Swift or not, say they don't know, but yeah, th there it is. Um, I just don't know. Alternatively, if you're new to programming, go play Minecraft. Make stuff in Redstone. Um, it teaches great logic fundamentals. You could go make something in Lua script. There's thousands and thousands of games where you can make simple mods in Lua, and that's a great way for people who have no idea about coding to just get their hands dirty without really breaking an environment. Um, if you're not new to programming, um, I will still harp on about Xcode till the cows come home because, frankly, 
Eclipse, Visual Studio, the VBA editors, every single other thing that I can think of um, is just crap by comparison. Um, I really like Objective-C despite the fact it has some really archaic bolt-ons. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny. You can forgive Objective-C for its failings because they're bolt-ons, whereas you get more annoyed at Swift, even if, even if they're less problematic, you get more annoyed at them because it's like, this was done from scratch, it should be perfect. But with programmers, there's always going to be people complaining about whatever you do, so. Um, but I think the biggest obstruction to developing in an Apple environment is the Apple environment, as I said, because unless you are an, unless you are an Apple shop and you're building for an Apple shop, the best tools are only for you and you can't break out of that. So that's a pity. Um, I'd still recommend playing with Swift. It has some cool features. It has some great ideas in it. Um, but yeah, wait and see. So. At the end of all that, I'm disappointed. You're probably even more disappointed. Um, but there it is. The language has only just come out of beta, and it still needs fixing. It really feels like it should still be there, but it'll be good to see where it is in 12 months. Thank you. So are there any questions? Yeah, I'm just going to repeat the question for the microphone. Um, so the question was, um, without causing offence, do I think um, my expectations are set too high? Uh, what was the second part? Uh, or, or do I think that Apple's hype has pushed um, our, our own expectations too far? I think it could be a bit of both. Um, and the sort of issues that I'm seeing discussed, and I, I'm sorry I didn't include more examples of that, um, the, the issues I'm sort of seeing discussed are, it's so close to being perfect, but here are these problems, why oh why couldn't they have gotten it right? Um, and so that could very well be our expectations are too high type problem. Um, I think our expectations as programs are, programmers are generally going to be for perfection, so that's a valid question. I think probably where I would have liked to have seen it was just a couple of minor tweaks. Um, so for example, take optionals. The, the whole point of implicit optionals is that they, you, that there's no value set on them till you set a value, then they're golden, except that um, one of the great things about Swift is that it interfaces with Objective-C. In interfacing with Objective-C, Objective-C can in fact pass nil values back to implicit um, optionals and all your code breaks because everything thinks that the value's been set. It's, it's problems like that that kind of undermine the whole feature and I don't know how they'll be fixed. Um, and if they can be fixed, that will greatly change my perspective of it. Now, whether Apple's marketed it too much, I don't think they did. I think it's that we've all become so used to Apple releasing something and we generate our own hype. Um, Apple just kind of said, here's this new language, we think it's cool, where we did it because Objective-C is archaic, so here are some things we wanted to see improved. So, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. OK, yep. That, that, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat it. So the, the comment was that um, Apple was more about looking at Swift being a long term replacement rather than here is the great new thing. Um, I'd say that's a better description of what they did than what I said. Yes, I would agree. So that's why I asked whether it's mm. Mm -hmm. Have themselves still not finished and developed or Yeah. 
Well, I mean, blocks are only like two years old or something from memory. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So to take that point, I, um, what I was saying earlier is that the whole industry kind of churns on a whim, and that's part of the problem. In churning on a whim, we we put, in some cases, too much pressure on these things to be rolled out when they're not ready. Um, so, were there any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.